I remember the first time I saw breakdancing was on 2020, and that's where I heard of hip hop. Really, Gabe. you found out about hip hop through Barbara Walters through 2020. <laughs> that's how you look. That's how you got your information back Tonight, then. Tonight we have to meet. Eric Sermon of EPMD and his song, The Crossover. Dude, they played breakdancing <laughs> on 2020. I was sitting in front of my TV. How white like, are you? I was in you fifth grade, hip -hop. fourth grade, and I was like, I'm, I'm fucking water. in, dude. I am so in. <laughs> Biggie, 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 can't you see? Sometimes your road just hypnotize me. And I just love y'all, ski ba do. This is when I ski and you're so true. I know those aren't the words, but you know the song. It's Hypnotize from Notorious B.I.G. from his 1997 album, Life After Death. It's also number 476 out of 500 on the 500 with Josh Adam Myers. What's up, Fleece Army? How's your week going? How are you doing? It's me, Josh Adam Myers, the King of Fleece, guiding you through Rolling Stone Magazine's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. And man, oh man, am I having a good time doing this. Hopefully you guys are enjoying listening to it. I want to say thank you to everybody that is doing what I'm asking. The Instagram stories. Take a shot of how you're listening to the 500 and tag me on Instagram. Instagram stories, guys. Give me a 24-hour ad on your Instagram story page. All you got to do, take the screenshot, put it up there. Tag me at Josh Adam Myers. Put hashtag the 500 podcast. Give me that 24 hour ad to try to get the word out so people know what the fuck I'm doing. All right. Well, it's April 17th, everybody. So let's find out what happened in music today. In 1993, on April 17th, Susanna Hoffs from the Bengals married director Jay Roach. Susanna Hoffs, I had the biggest crush on her when I was younger from the Walk Like an Egyptian video. Just the cutest thing I'd ever seen in my life. She's still adorable to this day. But when she's in that music video and she does this, she goes like, Walk Like an Egyptian. And then her eyes like move over to the right. My little, I don't know what, seven year old body felt a tingle unlike anything it had felt before. God bless you, Susanna Hoffs. If you, you and Jay break up, I'm single. I just joined Raya. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go on dating apps, everybody. This album this week, uh, very, very important album to me and to my guests. I can still remember the first time I heard this record. Uh, it was probably one of the most popular albums in my high school when it came out. I remember the music videos from it. I remember going to parties, like being an underage kid and drinking. And this was one of the albums that they just blared. And it really, really affected my guest. My guest this week is comedian, podcaster, and life of the party, Bert the Machine Kreischer. You know him from his Netflix special, Secret Time. From his podcast, BertCast. Or maybe you know him from his performance of Hire by Creed on my TV show on Comedy Central called The Comedy Jam. Bert is one of the most fun people I've ever met in my life. Uh, one of my favorite stories about hanging out with Bert was me, Ryan Sickler, Adam Ray, and him were walking around Vegas at a casino because we all went to Crapshoot Comedy Festival together. And Bert, who had been drinking a little bit, went, let's go put $100 on black. And so me, Adam, and Ryan and Bert went over to the table, put $100 on black. We hit. And then as I'm going to take my money, Bert just goes, let it ride. Let it ride. And then everybody starts chanting it. And so we all look at each other. We're like, fuck it. Let it ride. And boom, we hit again. And then he kept saying, let it ride. And boom, we hit again. And then boom, we hit again. It was the most fun experience of my life. And that is the kind of person that Burt Kreischer is. He is the life of the party. 
Don't forget to listen to the end of the podcast where we spotlight a new artist that was directly influenced by Notorious B.I.G. Also, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you listen. Dude, if you guys listen through Apple, leave a five-star rating, write a little review about how much you're enjoying it. Do it for me. It helps our numbers. We're trying to grow this thing. Follow me at Josh Adam Myers on all social media. Email the podcast at 500 podcast at gmail.com. And you can send us anything. Just if you want to submit your music for us to play at the end, email it to us. If you want to tell us to go fuck ourselves, email it to us. And if you want anything and everything that has to do with the 500, go to our website, the500podcast.com. Well, police army, all that's left to do is say, here we go, with number 476 out of 500, with life after death by Notorious B.I.G. Bird, 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 can't you see? Sometimes your bird just birds me, and I just... All right, there you go. We're in a time crowd. <laughs> 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 what made you choose this record, man? Like, this is this still kind of blows my mind that this is the one that you wanted to do. 1997, April of 1997, me and Biggie shared the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. The picture was back, but the, he- the one at the two, the right and the left side said uh, Notorious B.I.G., uh, R.I.P. with his dates, uh, yeah. dot, 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 to 297. And then right to the right was uh, floor, the number one party animal in the country was me. And so this this album came out at the most pivotal time in my life when I went from just a college student to all of a sudden Oliver Stone's optioning the rights to my life. The future is mine. The oyster is mine. I have every opportunity granted to me that I want when it comes to stand up and Notorious B.I.G. just died and this album comes out. Dude, it's all you know I had a teacher, uh, Coach Wiener, who every time we listened to R. E. M. He would remember this road trip he took with his buddy. <laughs> sometimes. All right. <laughs> and so whenever I hear this album, I think of me and my Jeep Cherokee driving around oh, Florida yeah, State dude. going, one more month and I'm off to New York. It literally, it's, it's my baptism song. So it's you're, my baptism album. So you're, this is when you were still in Florida? I was just still in Florida State. I was in Florida State. This album came out. Game changer. Game changer. So this is all you listen to during all that time? I li- you know, it's, it's funny. All I ever listened to is hip hop. And what's insane about this album for me is that no one ever fucked with the East Coast. Wu Tang Clan was barely played in Florida. No one knew anything about the Wu Tang. Really? No one fucked with the East Coast at all. At all. It's because of the way we take in music. The way you take in music in Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Texas, California is you listen to it in a car. Okay. So it's meant to be heard in a car. Yeah. So that's the kind of music we enjoyed. Anything that was meant to be in earbuds or ear headphones, like New York on a subway, was all very lyrical. They didn't care about bass because headphones didn't play bass that way. And so this album, so like we only knew the West Coast. We knew who Biggie was because of the Tupac beef. We knew who uh, Puffy was because of Suge Knight. I mean, you got to remember, at this point, uh, Snoop, uh, Dre, Suge, and Tupac are on the cover of The Source and that that black like picture of the four of their faces. So you're you're a real hip hop fan, hardcore. That is not I something a, I was. <laughs> I'm such a hip hop fan that I am embarrassed of it. I thought it like, was going to be like, well, you know, I listened to some Alan Jackson, like down by the river on the hoochie coochie. And my no, TV. no, no, no. I am legit a hip hop fan. Yeah, legit. First album I ever listened to ever was uh, Roxanne, Roxanne, uh, Roxanne Chante. Roxanne, I don't know Roxanne. That one, no. I want to be your man. Dun, dun. And then Roxanne's Revenge. Then the Fat Boys. Then Will Smith. Then And then it kind of grew. It was like uh, uh, EPMD. It, it just kind of blossomed. And I would discover hip-hop 
all through friends. I mean, like I remember the first time I saw breakdancing was on 2020, and that's where I heard of hip hop. Really, like, really, you found out about hip hop through Barbara Walters through 2020. <laughs> that's how you look. That's how you got your information back Tonight, then. Tonight we have to meet. Eric Sermon of EPMD and his song, The Crossover. Dude, they played breakdancing <laughs> on 2020. I was sitting in front of my TV. I How was like, white are you? I was in you fifth grade, hip -hop fourth from, grade, and I was like, I'm fucking water. in, dude. I am so in. I was so into hip hop that I had... I had a uh, I had a stereo that had a dual cassette recorders, right? So you could technically record one and play one. But what I would do is I would keep in uh, reggae on one yeah. and hip hop on the other. And if a girl called, I'd turn off hip hop and put on reggae, <laughs> so I sounded cool. <laughs> oh yeah, what's all just like? Pass the Dutchie on the left one time. <laughs> and you're just like, dude, Tell me yeah. to pick you up later. We'll meet at Buffalo Wild Wings. Pass the Dutchie. Dude, that is hysterical. I never would have assumed that you were into hip hop, hardcore, and and I think, I think probably my 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 uh, uh, what's the big mountain? My rush my, my, my Mount Rushmore. Yeah, who are they? Of hip hop, it, it's got to be Outkast, uh, Tupac, Biggie, and then Eminem. I gotta okay. put Snoop up there too. I mean, Snoop was a huge influence. But the thing I, and we'll talk about this in a second, but the thing I loved about what Snoop was doing and what Biggie does so brilliantly on this album is, and clearly you'll get this from my stand up, is he tells stories. Yes. I yes. love the storytelling element. It was so, it drew me in. It was a great way for you to remember how to sing along with it because once you knew the story, you knew the lyrics. It's just like it's just like learning lines for uh, for like uh, an audition. It's like if you understand what your what the whole movement is, yeah. Yeah, and probably four years before this album came out, uh, Doggy Style came out. Murder was the case was my favorite song I had ever heard in my life. Murder was a case was all about him getting shot maybe gonna die maybe it was it was the greatest song but it was this like story and so when this album came out dude his first his first song on this album is a story about his friend coming with blood on him and he yeah. thinks he's about to get robbed you hear the rain in the background name a rapper today that's putting rain in the background of their music I mean, I, it, I don't know. No, <laughs> I'm not really paying attention to the weather in the songs, dude. It was. It just doesn't happen. No one's putting. No one's putting background noises in albums. No one's putting like like fucking. Oh, it's. I'll listen. I'll agree on that. that yeah. That there's not so like it used to be like it was like song song sketch song song. Dude. You know whatever spoken word you know or sampling. It's like it's this this really like listening to this record took me back to I mean high school. Immediately, it you took were in me, high school when this came out. I was, yeah, this came out in 97. 1997. Let's, let's just jump into what the record is. It's our album is number 476 out of 500. It is the second studio album, Life After Death by Notorious B.I.G., released on March 25th, 1997. He died on March 8th. 1997 yeah so it's basically uh he was leaving a party uh and while at the same time you're at florida state and named the top partier of the year how so how important or how did this album affect you at that time uh i've always said i'm a man of of a low threshold for epiphanous moments yeah i find things i can get the meaning of something can be so heavy to me that it can like bring me to tears this album this is, you gotta remember, this was when you had one CD one in, one CD out. Yeah. You didn't have a five disc changer in your truck. You had one CD in, one CD out. You had dude, to be a baller to have the disc changer. Dude, this album meant everything to me. I when I listened to it, not only do I remember the lyrics, not remember, only to remember where I was when I heard certain songs. Yeah. If you gotta remember, this album was also an anthem. I was named the number one party animal in the country, and Mo Money Mo Problems is playing in clubs in in Tallahassee yeah. and I'm thinking this is my man I'm blowing up I'm going to the top I'm going to the top I was written up in Rolling Stone as the number one party animal in the country Oliver Stone option the rise of my life I tried stand up I was good at it I'm fucking done <laughs> That's I it. will be hanging out with Puffy in a matter of days <laughs> I love it instead oh, it was Will Smith <laughs> yeah well, I mean either dude, way the first, still, I Will Smith, the first thing I said when I met Will Smith dude I have a development deal to do a sitcom I sit down with Will Smith at the hip, hip factory in upper on the Upper East Side the first thing I said is who who killed Biggie? That's the first thing I said. Who killed Biggie? And what did he say? He goes, I don't fucking know. <laughs> you think, I'm, you think I'm, I've been holding it to tell you? <laughs> um, 
All right, so I'm just so surprised that 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 you were the hip hop fan, and also how important this record was to you. You know what's funny about me is that when this came out, uh, I wasn't listen. I'm not gonna say I didn't listen to it, like yeah. I knew the hits, but I was such a Wu Tang Clan fan yeah. that everything was Wu Tang. Ev, I wouldn't listen to anything but Wu Tang, and if it wasn't Wu Tang, I was like, it's garbage. And now listening to the album, like I realize how important he was as a lyricist, as somebody in hip hop. And I think this album, I do feel like it deserves to be on the list, but I kind of feel that if they cut 10 songs from it, it would be a perfect record. If they, uh, well, first of all, I would argue every, every, there's like three songs I don't like, three or four songs that I've never listened to and I still won't listen to. Sure. They just don't. Do you know what they are? uh, It's anything about someone who's already died or him fucking a chick. If, if it's a love song, I don't like like uh, uh, romantic R and B uh, songs. Yeah, that b- black dudes sing because technically I feel like they're talking about fucking me. Yeah, really. Like, that's what that's. He's like, yeah. <laughs> I rub I rub my tongue down your back to your crack, and I'm like, hey man, I'm the one listening. Like, yeah, I don't want you to rub your tongue down my back or my crack. <laughs> I'm not. I, you <laughs> say her, like put her, not you. Yeah. Who the fuck do you think's listening to this album, Biggie? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I spit on your nipples. I rub them gently. I'm like, <laughs> like it's fucking not. And uh, and I realized in listening to this recently, I realized I don't like songs about dead people. I okay. like songs about killing people. <laughs> All right. Like so if his homie's dead, I don't want to hear it. Well, I feel like I feel like this record is a mixture of the songs that Biggie wanted to do and the songs that Puff Daddy wanted to do. I feel like I gotta be honest with you, I feel like this album is a mixture of Puff Daddy's music and Biggie's lyrics. Okay. Because if you if you like they also released another album posthumously where they took a lot of these flows and Biggie remastered them and did a bunch of different uh d- a different like yeah, mashups I know, I know with other about, yeah. artists like Eminem was on it I think Lil Wayne was on it the Hot Boys were on it and um and there's lyrics in there the lyrics in here stand up and could be put to any fucking beat like I feel like Biggie real I feel like Biggie really just fucked with lyrics and Puffy really had a a brilliant way of you know, this is also you gotta remember this is before sampling was illegal. Like yeah, th- yeah, th- this you're was right. this, this was it, the beginning of sampling. Yeah, th- I mean, and, and there's so many different elements of music that are like thrust into this record. It's like you can hear. I mean, the most popular song, "Hypnotized," is if I'm not mistaken, is a track by Herb Albert. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's built around the sample from 1979 hit Rise by Herb Albert. And then it's also got a hook lifted by Slick Rick. There's so much that I think is like brought into this. But let's dive into the record, okay? Let's do it. So I want to, let's let's see. All right, so it starts off with uh, Life After Death intro, which is just the piano, the the ambulance sound, the heart monitor. Hold on, pa- hold on. Which, which, what you got to say. Yeah, go ahead. Is like when we're hearing this for the first time, he had just been murdered. Yes, I didn't even think about that. It's it's like, well, this just every element in this record is so creepy. Just yeah. even the way it ends with "You're nobody till somebody kills you." Dude, I mean, it's, all of it's, it. It's just what's beef, dude. All of you got to remember, like this is this is not just listening to an album. This is like listening, reading a suicide note. This is like reading the last words before someone died, and it's all about dying. It's so much about dying. And yeah. all the shit going on in his life. Dude, it was so heavy to get this album. When you got Tupac's album, I, All Eyes on Me, you bumped it and you you put on khakis because you were like, we're a West Coast now, <laughs> yeah. right? I threw on a tank top khakis and fucking Converse. And I was like, I wrote Thug Life across my chest. I'm not even fucking kidding. I don't Talk about it. culture emo- appropriation. <laughs> I, I did tattoo for tattoo. He had on his body, on my body, and went out drinking that night and had a fucking blast. When Biggie died, you sat with this album like, holy fuck. Wow, yeah. I this get- is like a love letter for his fucking tombstone. Do you remember where you were when you found out? And, uh, well, I don't remember where I was when I found out. I remember I was in art class. Oh, really? Mr. Moran's art class, and it was just, there were there were people that were really broken up, and I mean, I was, I, like I said, I wasn't a huge fan. I mean, I felt bad, but it's like now looking back, it's like, Jesus Christ, like what would this guy have done if he just would have stuck around? But the intro song is basically him picking up 
from the previous album where it's in Ready to Die, it left off with suicidal thoughts. You have Biggie despondently deciding to go through with it. And then we hear Puffy mourning him and we're left to believe uh, the following record will reflect this final journey, what, which it kind of does. Yeah. So this song is basically about suicide. And I mean, we've, we all know what happened with, with Brody recently, and I've been through some shit. Uh, have you ever considered suicide? Never. Or have you ever had a low point in your life? And how did you get out of that? I've never considered suicide. Uh, I've had lots of low points. <laughs> Do you have anything where you were like, this? what's the lowest it's been and how did you get out of that? <laughs> I've had a lot of them. <laughs> uh, I've had the lowest part of my entire life. I was upset. I was going, dealing with obsessive compulsiveness. I had just moved to New York. I had my first one night stand ever. Uh, and it's, And this gay guy that I was working with got herpes. And I convinced myself I got a venereal disease that I got genital warts. I convinced myself. Did you have anything? Did no. Like, did, there were no signs, no little, no there little doodads signs. on your route. There weren't, weren't signs. What had happened is before the internet, we had we had gone to a medical <laughs> journal. Me laugh. We had got a oh dude, this is the worst. We got to a medical journal, and he we had found what he had, and he goes, "That's what I got. Fuck, I got it." And so then I was like, "Woo!" And I just had a one night stand. So we kept flipping through things, looking for yeah. more stuff he had. And I was like, "That's crazy." I go to take a shit in the employee bathroom, and I look at my dick. I haven't looked at my dick in forever. I looked at my dick. I had a one night stand, yeah. and I see my circumcision scar. You know that ring you have around your oh, dick? Oh yeah. The- I'd never really seen it before. <laughs> I'd never really investigated my dick before. Now I'm looking. How old at are you? That. F- 25. You never stared at your dick for a long period of time. Never. I never. Ju- I never. You gotta just- take more baths, dude. That's it's, <laughs> it's great. I either beat it up or I fucking let it be. <laughs> and so, so I convinced myself I had genital warts. I started then self-medicating, dipping my dick and balls in white vinegar uh, at every evening, watching Quantum Leap, smoking a joint, and drinking show. a 40. Yep. That was my fucking show, dude. And I love that you love Quantum dude, Leap. I love Quantum Leap. And sure <laughs> enough, I got I spun into a spiral. I had my lowest point. I was walking through Washington Square Park. It was beautiful weather. It was the summer. Girls were wearing no bras. The fountain's on. Everyone's yeah. sitting around. It's just perfect. And... uh I just remember being like, how can anyone find joy in this? Wow. But, and I, I was really low. And then, you know, I, you, I, you, for me, for me, it, I, I went to a dermatologist. I went to a doctor. They told me I had nothing. I started to believe it. I took mushrooms one night, and it kind of got me into a better place. I went and saw widespread panic. I, and I, yeah, I, I get there a lot. I, I've gotten there a lot. I've been there a lot. But it's just it's stupid but i for me it's just like keep moving forward that's it i couldn't agree more just keep I, moving forward i couldn't agree more i i've never been suicidal no. but uh when angelo died i took oxycontin and fentanyl and all that stuff like with the hopes that i would overdose cuz i didn't want i didn't want to be alive but i was too afraid to do it yeah uh but because of this song biggie literally followed through with what he did on the end of ready to die and then it jumps into which a song you already mentioned. Somebody's gotta die. Uh, Peter, play that motherfucking intro because I love the way when this kicks in, right with the flatline sound. So Biggie's dead, and then we go in to this. Basically, it's a story of 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 a revenge story. A friend dies, and they want revenge. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this song? I listened to it with my daughter the other day. <laughs> and what did she say? She was like, hold on. This is very violent, Daddy. You like <laughs> this? And I was like, oh, I love it. Dude, I love it. I love it. What I love about it is you hear the rain. I yeah. love I you love, love you, you love weather and so I lo- no I just I love that it's not I love that it's a, I, that it's a fucking it's part Adam Sandler skit you know yeah like in Adam Sandler Adam Sandler was really big at the time too his uh, comedy album I don't know if you remember it but his comedy album was fucking great but he'd have the audience and it was like a real it was like layering a song for me 
Yeah. Just the and you were like, oh, this is more than a song. This is a story that's built into a moment that you're living with him. He's singing about what you're living with him. I fucking loved it, dude. Yeah. Uh, Peter, this is my this is my favorite verse. Play minute three, second oh eight. Exchange hugs and pounds before the throwdown. How it's gonna go down, ladies, niggas, slow down, slow down. Uh, fuck all that planet shit. Run up in their cribs and make the cats abandon shit. See niggas like you do ten year bids, Mr. Nigga. They want the murder innocent kids, not I. He says, exchange hugs and pounds before the throwdown. How's it going to go down, ladies? Uh, I don't know what to do. There's so much I want to quote. It's, it is, it's, it's almost cultural appropriation on me and you talking about this album. The N-word is so laden in it. It's just, there's so much. And do you I've sing ever, the N-word when you're in your car by yourself? Oh, yeah. I mean, sing the song. Yeah, yeah dude. It's like, sing the but N-word. I mean, but I'm saying it in, in, in a song and, 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 you know, it's like, I didn't say that. Like, Method Man said it. I'm yeah. just singing his lyrics. But I love these lyrics. Now, this song, people were saying this was about a beef between the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, Puffy had said it's not written about anybody. It's literally just a revenge story. Now, let me ask you a question. How far have you gone to get back at somebody? I believe in karma. So it's just talking behind their back. Really? So I believe in just talking behind someone's back. Like if someone does me wrong, I, I, pro- I probably let them think that we're friends. Yeah. Like if they do me wrong and I know about it or it or it hurts my feelings, I'll let them think we're friends. But to my friends, I'll tell them who they are. I'll tell okay. them. Yeah. Like I don't, I'll be like, just so you know, that guy might think we're close. Fuck him. He's bad news. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's happened. Like I, I only have like I only have like a handful of like tight, tight, tight friends. Yeah. But I have a bunch of friends. Like, like I'd say me and you are friends. We're friends, Definitely yeah. friends. If you needed something, I'd help you out. But if me and you were hanging out, and, and I think we're friends, but if we're hanging out and all of a sudden you raise your voice at me and, try, and yell at me in front of a bunch of people and get in my face like we're going to fight, and, I don't, and that is never something I would, I would ever do to you. I would never humiliate you or something like that. It's dead. You're dead to me. In my head, you're dead to me. And, and I would, I'd, be like, I'd be like, oh, I guess that's how he sees me. I guess that's who he really is. He showed me his real colors. Yeah. And so then you may go, hey, man, I was really sorry about that. I go, yeah, sure, of course. But then to my, to my friends, I'd be like, You're like fuck, hey, that, fuck guy. that guy, dude. Stay away from that guy. Tr- I, trust me. Because people will take liberties with me that they won't take with other people. Like, no one's going to raise their voice at Segura. No one's going to get in Segura's face. No one's going to fucking yell at him backstage. Dude, what the fuck? You, you're going over your time. But people feel like they can take those liberties with me because I'm such a nice guy. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's happened a bunch. I've had a bunch of people like where he's just real shitty people. By the way, they're not... They're not around anymore. A lot of these people I'm talking about, you don't see them anymore. Yeah. <laughs> because they work their way out of the system. I'm that fucking litmus where, like, if someone's going to be a cunt, they're a cunt to me first because they feel like they can get away with it. And so I, I don't like confrontation, so I'm not going to get in your face. I'm not, hey, man, I heard you were talking shit about me. I don't need that. It's like I already know how you feel about me. What do I need to, what do I need to prove, you know? Yeah. Uh, that goes in to the classic hypnotize i still remember the first time i heard this this was biggie's first number one hit and it's easy to see why like i said it was built around rise and uh number one hit from the from 1979 by jazz fusion trumpeter herbert out herb albert uh play the chorus into the second verse I put Jose NY onto DKNY. Uh-huh. Miami, DC, prefer Versace. Mm-hmm. Right. All Philly hoes know it's Mosquito. Every cutie with the booty bought a coochie. Now who's the real dookie? So the really cool story about this song. So uh, Biggie, not Biggie, Puffy had gone to Herb Albert to try to get the rights for this song. A few other people had tried to do it. I think Vanilla Ice, if I'm looking correctly. Ice Cube, Easy e Vanilla Ice, and maybe four or five other artists tried to get it. So when Biggie heard this track, they recorded the demo, and then they took that cassette to Herb Albert and played it for him and immediately he was like yes 
not for anybody else, yeah. but he knew immediately this was going to be a number one song. Now, this is basically just a party banger that's loaded with a lot of braggadocio, and it sounds just like an effort to pick up ladies. Have you ever had to lie to get with a lady? Yeah. Every single one of them. <laughs> One hundred. Can't be honest. You're like no, 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 no. This is the, no. the, the lies me. That's when, like, when they were like, I, how, "What's going on with you?" I was like, "Oh, like six months into the relationship. Oh yeah, this is the real me. This is the one I was <laughs> hiding from you. The one that drinks way too much at home by himself. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, yeah, dude. Every fucking chick. I mean, I my, my I, I've never been as good at. I have a buddy. We'll just call him El Mentiroso. We used to call him the liar in yeah. Spanish. And he was good. He'd come home and literally be two steps in front of the girl going, don't worry, I'm going to check the, I'm going to make sure the dog's up. And then go, just for the record, I'm in spring training for the Yankees. All right, let's go. And then you'd be, you'd have to like improv with his lies and be like, she like, so how do you guys even know him? And like, we grew up together. And he's like, yeah. we used to all play baseball together. They went to college. I just live with them, but I play basically spring training for the Yankees. So what's the, what's the, give me a lie that you, that you've had to tell a woman to get with, uh, anything you ever said to Leanne, what was your lie for Leanne? <laughs> I'm in control of my drinking. <laughs> 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 you know, what's so funny is so Leanne thought I was holding a huge lie when we met. Yeah. She thought I was a drug dealer. Really? Why would she think you were a drug dealer? Because I, it's, it's, it's just a perfect storm. I have money. Right? Yeah. But she didn't know what I did because I didn't work really. I just would do spots. But she didn't know that I was doing spots. Just when I wasn't going out with her, I'd do spots. I wouldn't like, I told her I was a comedian, you know, when I met her, but I had tons of money. Like, I'd, I'd had two deals back to back and a TV show. So I had tons of money. I lived sure. in a mansion up in the hills. I drove a brand new uh, fucking expedition. And I kept my drugs in my closet, like just pot. Yeah. I kept it in the closet. So. Sometimes people come over and want to get one pot. And I'd be like, oh, I have some. And I'd yeah. take them into my closet. So one day we're laying in bed in a hotel in Palm Springs. And she's like, okay, I've got to ask this. Do you deal drugs? And I was like, huh? She's like, do you deal drugs? And now I'm thinking about all these times that it did seem like I dealt drugs. And I was like, no. And she goes, how do you have money? Like, I'm freaking out. <laughs> Am I in love with a drug dealer? I go, oh, no. <laughs> I'm successful. <laughs> I'm actually doing pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I had development deals. She goes, "What's a development deal?" I go, "I'm in one right now. They just give you money not to do." But anything. wait, why wouldn't you just tell her that? Why? Because that's I, like that's that's you, that was something you don't have to lie to get laid. You have all this great shit going on. I, I wasn't the kind. Of, I'm still not the kind of person to be like, "Hey, did I tell you how much money I have?" Not like, saying that, but it's just like you know, you you go out on a date. And she said, well, "What are you doing?" Well, I just got this. I got a development deal. That's what I'm working on now. And oh and no, blah, blah, blah. Sure, but that just never you. came up. I'm a comedian, and I had. I had like I think I had like fucking seven hundred thousand dollars in the bank. I had just Good tons of God. money. God, how dude, old were you? Uh, twenty seven, twenty eight. Good for you. And I dude. just had all this fucking money in the bank, and uh, and I just tore through it. I tore through it. I yeah. spent that money so quickly. You have no idea. Really? Well, taxes take a fucking half of it right it takes there. Takes a lot of it, dude. Yeah, but uh, but she literally thought I was hiding something from her when I first met her. Yeah, and then and then we started obviously getting to know each other. And she went to a comedy show, and she was like, oh, oh. And then she saw me act in a play, and she was like, you do not deserve that money. <laughs> <laughs> what was the play? It was a play about four guys who moved to Cape Canaveral to have shuttle launch parties, but they moved there right when they stopped doing shuttle launches. Yeah. So they lived there for four years, and the day they decided to move out, there's a shuttle launch, right? So they have their first shuttle launch party after living together for four years. They all now hate each other because they've never had one shuttle launch party. And they sneak into Cape Canaveral and accidentally blow up the space shuttle. The fucking play opened the day the space shuttle exploded. No, it didn't. I swear to you on my children, <laughs> the, the space it? shuttle exploded in re-entry. One of the tiles came off, I think. Yeah. It explodes. And my buddy Croy calls me. He goes, I'm sorry. Are you on the news right now? And I go, no. And he goes, <laughs> our play that's opening tonight about this, us blowing up the space shuttle, there's been a space shuttle explosion. And we were like, shut the fuck up. There's no fucking way. I swear to you. All oh, my children. That is so. That is so great, though. And there were How like many the, people showed up that night? Uh, seven, probably. Okay. Well, you know. And they were like, "The show must go on," and so we did it. And by the time <laughs> we were like, "Oh my god, it exploded!" Everyone's like, "Holy fuck!" Too soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go into kick in the door. Peter, play the intro. Play the intro. Biggie. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh. This goes out. Biggie. To 
This goes out to you and you and you, Biggie, you. This goes out to you. This goes out to you. This goes out to you. It's, Can I tell you what's crazy about those songs? Me. Well, go ahead. I never knew anything about guns, so I didn't know when he was like, kick in the door, bring in the full full. Yeah. I was like, just going like this? Like, I don't, I, like, <laughs> showing up four on one fan and four on the other. I didn't know he was talking about it's guns. It's intimidating, flashing fingers at the guy. Yeah, was he 44? He's 44 years old? I thought he was my age. I mean, I, I knew I knew immediately a 4-4 was a gun, but uh, I, I love this fucking song so much. Peter, play minute three, second 16. This is the dopest verse. On your mark, get set when I spark your wet. Look how dark it get when you mark for death. Should I start your breath or should I let you die? In fear, you start to cry. Ask why. Lyrically, I worship. Don't front the word sick. You cursed it, but rehearsed it. I drop unexpectedly like bird shit. You heard skip. Don't forget the publishing. I punish them. I'm done with them. Son, I'm surprised you run with them. I think they got common. This is the best part. Common them because they nothing but dicks. I fucking love that line. Now, this is a song that he basically wrote uh, in response to Nas, J. Ru the Damager, Raekwon, Ghostface Killer. It's a track produced by DJ Premier. Um, there, when he says, I love this, dude. When he says the line, fuck that, why try throw bleach in your eye is a reference to Raekwon's jab on the track Ice Water. Uh, from only Bill from Cuban Links. Uh, it's dude. It's there's so many different like like he sh you just see all the different people like he has the lines in the final verse are directed at Nas as a reference to Nas challenging the notorious B.I.G. for the title of King of New York in the song The Message. Uh, I dude. It's I, I there's so many different references now. Do you currently have any beef with anybody? Oop! All my beef's been squashed. All of it? All of it. Well, not all of it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple. Yeah. All right. Uh, goes into Fucking You Tonight. This is now the first. I can't listen to this. By the way, this is when you realize this album was written by a 23-year-old. Because <laughs> the Why? fucking lyric is so on the nose. I'll be fucking you tonight. Like, there's no, uh, there's no uh, illusion. There's no reference. There's no art artistry in it. It's just like I'm fucking you tonight. Oh, I mean, it's they're they're not hiding or not, they're not pulling any. There's no nuance. At all. There's no. Uh, <laughs> but dude, I'm not gonna lie to you. Like, I you know I know people like shit on R. Kelly, and I mean I just watched the documentary, so I'm like Jesus Christ, this guy was fucked. But dude, is this chorus catchy as fuck? Peter, play the chorus real quick. There's a funny part in the song. Go to uh, s go to minute three, part thirty-seven, when R. Kelly sings the bridge. Bring that ass to me. So he says, he says, he says, I, he's basically, I know he's talking to a girl, but he's like, let's stop the bullshit, baby. Uh, let me take you to this spot if you hot. So you want to be with me, Puff Daddy, B-I-G, bring that ass to me. And it's just, when listening to that, I was like, is he trying to fuck Biggie? Like... I know it's. I know it's like almost like you said about the experience that you had. When that's why you don't listen, can't listen to, to these songs. He, he talks about what he's going to do to them, and he but he's singing in, to you in the first person. Like, yeah. I'm going to rub you down. I'm going to lick your nipples. I'm going to play with your asshole. And you're like, hey man, give her a name. Well, I think they, I think they do know that this is like the song that most guys skip over, and this is like definitely the female song. But it's literally. About just freaky shit, which if it's because it's R. Kelly, then you I'm know it's freaky. You tonight. What is the most memorable or bizarre sexual experience you've had? Huh. Well, my first one was pretty memorable. How so? Uh, I didn't put the condom on right, and then when I did put it on right, I got on top of her, three pumps, looked at her, totally done, and she was like, "Are you gonna put it in?" And I looked down, and my dick was between her butt cheek and the bed. <laughs> that was the first time I lost my virginity. <laughs> That was fucking yeah. Did you eventually go? Okay, it goes in oh, and here. I, and no, then, and then I and then I've already compromised the integrity of the condom. I then go and have <laughs> sex with her. It was one of the worst experiences of my entire life. 
Yeah, yeah, I've had a few. Uh, because I'm fucking the mattress tonight. <laughs> yeah. That goes into Last Day. Uh, I didn't really like this song that much. Uh, this is the song he does with the locks. Uh, the By the way, I did like this song, and I ended up buying the locks' this album. Did you because, because of, of this? this? I bought everyone's album except Jay-Z. Really? I bought everyone that had an you album. You bought Lil' Kim? I bought, yeah, of course, everyone bought Lil' Kim. But really? like, dude, I bought all every album of anyone on here can i tell you a little side story that is fucking Please. fascinating so i bought the junior mafia's album okay. right i'm sorry I, ref I i take that back i bought two albums i bought junior mafia and biggie's first album ready to die right okay i get biggie's album and i'm taking a bus ride to tampa i have my walkman and i have my headsets on i'm taking a bus from tallahassee to tampa and a black guy sits next to me and he's got a bottle of Jack Daniels, like a big bottle of Jack Daniels. Not the big, big handle, but a big bottle of Jack Daniels on the bus. And he looks at me and he's like, you want to pull? We're roughly the same age. You might be a little older. I said, yeah. So where are you from? He said, Sarasota. I said, oh, I'm from Tampa. He goes, going home? I said, yeah, I'm going home for a little bit. And he goes, what you listen to? And I said, uh, this guy, uh, Notorious B.I.G. And he's like, oh, man. You got Notorious B.I.G.? I was like, yeah. He goes, do you mind if I listen to it? And I was like, no, no, of course. So I give him my headsets. He listened to my headsets the whole fucking bus ride from Tallahassee <laughs> to Tampa. <laughs> You're trying to be a nice guy. And he nice starts guy. going through your iTunes the playlist. One time, the one time we stopped, the bus made a stop at a bus station in Live yeah. Oak. And we're, by the way, we're sharing this bottle. So we're drinking a bottle. So you felt like because he was giving you the booze that you were like, he, I, I don't. I guess I should let I him. I guess listen. I should let him. He's made, and, but, but he says to me in Live Oak, which is an hour away from Tallahassee, I said, so what were you doing in Tallahassee? And he said, time. I said, what? And he goes, I was in jail or prison. And I said, what for? And he goes, stabbing a man. I was like, yeah, keep the headsets, man. <laughs> Fucking keep the headsets. Yeah. Fuck. All right. The best part of last day is uh, minute two, second 45, uh, play Biggie's verse. Who the fuck want to squeeze? My desities make MCs freeze. You're waking up in cold sweats. They just dreams. You still apologizing, analyzing, my size and your sizing. Realize a fist fight will be asinine. You just pop wines, I must pop nines. Genuine steel piece, nozzle in your grill piece. You shook up two bricks every cook up. We can hook up. All I see is the future. Disrespect, I shoot you. What I like, like, not to put down the locks, but it's like the song for me really takes off the second Biggie gets in there. It's an okay song, Every but, song but takes Biggie, off. Biggie is, I mean, it's just like that's the person I want to hear rap. Uh, but this song is basically about your last day on this earth. If you had 24 hours left, what is your ideal last day? If I, now, am I dying or is everyone dying? Let's say uh, just you. Oh, dude. It's locked down here. It's locked down in this house. You just stay in here. I lock. I, yeah, lock it down. Doors are locked. Everyone's in the house. Build a fucking. We'll build a fort in the living room. <laughs> Open a bottle of champagne in the morning. Watch Goonies. <laughs> Sit with my family. Uh, play fucking Ruma Cube. I would lock it down in this house. I wouldn't go fucking anywhere. I'd lock it down in this house. What if everybody was dying? Oh, then I'm same. fucking everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking my dick on a tour of Chinatown. <laughs> Just come on, Leanne. Let's go. We're uh, doing everybody. I, I, I fantasize about about uh, some sort of apocalyptic moment happening here and yeah. me getting the family together, the backpacks, the go bags, the money, the guns, the dogs, the cat in the truck and fucking getting the fuck out. I fantasize about that. I was... Thinking of buying two dirt bikes so that Leanne and I could both put a kid on a dirt bike and just vroom, out of town. And go like Road Warrior Dude, style get the and fuck shit. out of town. Yeah, fuck dude. yeah. Uh, Make your way to the beach. Steal a boat. Get the fuck out of I got <laughs> Fucking bring that shit. <laughs> All right, that goes into I Love the Dough. Uh, this is another one of the songs I really didn't fuck with that much. Uh, it's kind of okay. But it's got Jay-Z in it. It it does. And by the way, this like, is before anyone knew Jay-Z. You know what's funny? I want to take that back because as I kept listening to this song, the more I started enjoying it, I started loving the chorus. Uh, Biggie's just got so many great lines. And then I'm not going to shit on Jay-Z either. Like both of them are both like, they, they both do kill it. And I, and I was playing, I was sitting with Joe DeRosa as we were driving to like Canners and I put this song on and I was like, this song actually isn't that bad. But I guess during the first pass, I wrote, okay, song. 
The chorus is good. The rest is unmemorable. I take that back, everybody. Uh, basically, Biggie and Jay-Z convincingly refute the popular misconception that money can't buy happiness. Both of them just trading back and forth lines about the glamorous lifestyles and that are superior to those that are lesser fortunate than them. I'd be curious to know B's net worth at the time the song was written. I mean, I would be it's gotta shocked. be a few mil, right? Nope. No, 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 no. You think he had nothing? No, I think he had absolutely nothing. I think everything was borrowed from the studio. I think his first contract was probably bullshit. I bet Puff made all the money on his first album. I guarantee it, because I mean, you think about it, he released that album Ready to Die and then went on the road because he was gonna start selling drugs again. What do you got? Who had, who had a net worth of twenty million dollars at the time of his death? I guess I was totally wrong about that. Yeah, he had <laughs> yeah. twenty. He was worth twenty million dollars. All right, what is the strangest or most demeaning thing you've ever done for money? I remember <laughs> one time. Well, I mean, I, I fucking rode roller coasters for three years. That was so great, Bert. <laughs> I told you that was like one of my favorite shows, dude. I I uh, I remember one time, um, I I jumped into a bowl of cranberry sauce. And my co-host at the time <laughs> was like, how much is this money mean to you? Like, you're willing to sacrifice your self-respect? And I was just like, what the fuck are you talking about? This is funny shit. I was a dominatrix camp for a day for money. Yeah. I, was a, I was a rodeo clown for a day for money. I fought a bear for money. I swam a great white shakes sharks out of the cage for money. I mean, I did, Hurt Burt was all for money. $16,000 an episode, and it, I almost died. Yeah. Really? yeah. When did you almost die from? The I got mauled by a bull. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've done a lot for How much money. did you get paid for the bull mauling? Well, per second, probably five bucks. Oh, Jesus. Because it literally happened in five seconds. They let him out of the thing, ring, and it came out, <laughs> m broke my ribs, broke my foot, and then I almost got pinned up against the wall. Yeah. Oh, wow. Did, yeah. How bad were the injuries? Oh, horrific. Yeah, we had to stop production. I've had a lot of injuries from television. But when it comes to what did I do for money, I fell off a waterfall for money. I fucking... Dude, I've done so much shit for money, you have no idea. So nice to just do stand-up for it right now. <laughs> yeah, <dude. laughs> All right, going on to What's Beef. Uh, I do love this song. Great song. I, I love the drums in it. Uh, play Biggie's verse, Peter. <laughs> Check out this bizarre uh, rapper style used by me. The B-I-G, I put my key, you put your key in. Money will be seen. We'll reach the fucking ceiling. Check Check it. My calico been top. Uh -huh. This rap, Alfred Hitchcock, drop top notch. Player hating won't stop. Uh, this instant, rappers too persistent. Quick to spit, biggie name on shit. Make my name taste like ass when you speak it. See me in the street, your jewelry, you can keep it. That be our little secret. See me. Uh, be that notorious, this is Notorious B.I.G. Uh, is sick of all the rap feuds involving rappers trading insults over songs and calling it beef. For Biggie, real beef involves sticks and stones, not words. Biggie died soon after this song was released, uh, most likely under the circumstances related to his beef with Tupac. Um, do you have any thoughts on this song? Dude, this song, I mean, this song, as soon as this came out, it's almost like there was a fucking, there was a a series of DVDs, like street DVDs that you could buy Yeah, called, uh, I think it was called What's Beef? And it was all about rapper beef. Oh, I remember seeing a few yeah, of those. Yeah, and I, I remember watching those and going like, that was all... Beef? Dude, I, they, there was always beef in the pack, but Biggie and Tupac took beef to the next fucking level. It sold fucking records. It made stars. Dude, it... I mean, you gotta remember, we didn't have the internet the way... It, I keep saying that. People don't understand that. We didn't have the internet the way we do now. You didn't know what was going on between Tupac and Biggie until you heard the song. And then when you heard the song, you had to kind of like extrapolate what you thought he meant about that guy. Yeah. That's the only way you could get this information. That's it. We're fucking white or kids you got in it, Or you got it from like MTV, from like Kurt Loder. Like yeah. they would do a lot of like, that's where I think I found out about the beef. And then I always remember that moment where, if I'm not mistaken, it's like at the BET Awards or the Vibe Awards where like Snoop Dogg, Excuse me, goes on stage with like Suge Knight. Snoop like Dogg shits. goes on stage and they boo him. Yes, and, and then, that's and it. Then it's Shug, in New York. And then Suge Knight comes out the next time and goes, uh, if any of you artists want to be an artist and not have the producers be all up in your videos. Yep. And then Puffy yep. comes out and he goes, we support all black people doing something with their lives. Congratulations to Death Row. Puffy tried to like squash it. 
But Suge Knight was like, no, man, this sells records. All right. Well, you you were a doorman at the Boston Comedy Club in New York, yeah. right? What is the worst shit you ever saw when being a doorman? I, I saw it all. I saw You want to know something crazy I saw? Go ahead. Dave Chappelle went up on stage one time, and he was drunk and, and probably high. And he had a joke. He was working out the premise was that they market cigarettes to black people. The way they make cool menthols are meant for black people. It's like a candy. It's like a they're marketing it to black people. And he said, what's next? Fried chicken flavored cigarettes? And everyone laughed, right? So then he's still drinking. He smokes all his cigarettes. And he's out of cigarettes. Realizes it. And he says to these white investment bankers in the front row, um, hey, man, can I get a cigarette from you? And the white guy goes, yeah, they're fried chicken flavored. And Dave goes, what the fuck did you say to me? <laughs> and the guy's like, hold on, we're, I didn't, we're all here, right? Like looks around and he's like, I said they're f fried chicken flavored. Dave goes, I'm sorry, did you just say that they're fried? Like he forgot his joke that he had said. Oh, and he's like, wow. Did you say they were fried chicken flavored to a black man? And the guy goes, yeah, it's your joke. You just did the joke, yeah. But Dave didn't remember it. And then Dave got pissed, like pissed, and was like kind of bowed up. And the guy's like, I mean, this is back when Dave was like 135 pounds. And the guy's like, hey, listen, man, I'm definitely not afraid of you. <laughs> and so the, the guy was like, all right, you want to fight? Let's fight. And Dave and him went at it. Godfrey jumped on stage. Greer Barnes was there. I want to say Mike Epps. It was like all these black comics and these four investment bankers went just fucking haymakers. Just fucking huge fucking Like a huge fight. brawl. In the, the fight, the all over a joke that Chappelle forgot he said. By the way, it must not have been that funny because it didn't make Dave laugh. <laughs> That's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. All right, mo money, mo problems. Boom. Play just play the fucking intro, Peter, because this song is so fucking catchy. This song basically discusses the troubles that come with affluence. And it was also released uh, after Biggie died and is considered one of the greatest hits in hip hop history, which contains this sample of Diana Ross's coming out. Uh, don't worry about Maze's verse. Don't worry about Puffy's verse. Just play minute 205. I just want to hear Biggie's verse. I fucking love this. B I G P O P P A. No info. No info for the D E A. Federal agents mad that I'm flagrant. Tap my cell and my phone in a basement. I mean, this is probably the most popular song off of this record. Easy. Hands down. This was the first. This was the song you listened to that first week. The week this dropped. This was the one song. This and going back to Cali were the two songs you listened to over and over and over again. And then you discovered the album. That's how hip hop worked for me back in the day. Yeah. You found one song and you fell in love oh, with yeah. it. Oh yeah. You overplayed the fuck out of it. And then the song before and after it, you go like, oh that's not that bad. And then you'd be like, wait, at a party, what's that? Wait, that's is that on? Is that on Life After Death? Oh shit, what song's that? Oh fuck, dude, this song. I remember listening to this at the TPC tournament I just, players. I just remember the the music video was so goddamn cheesy. Dude, dude. They cha it it's changed, like a it changed the golf way, tournament. It changed the way they started making music videos. I want to say because it had it that flashy, like that like flash. The yeah, the circle and then dancing through a hallway. Yeah. Um. So you've been quite successful throughout your career. What is your relationship with money, and how has it changed your relationships? I tear through it. I tear through it. You're bad with money? I'm horrible with money. That's so why I'm I. married. I've, I tear through <laughs> fucking money. I spend money. I remember at one time I had a business manager going, are you sick? And I was like, what? And he goes, well, you're spending like you're about to die. And I go, no, no, I'm healthy. He was like, well, slow the fuck down. If you plan on living another five years, I would slow the fuck down. Well, what's what's the first like big, like like extravagant thing that you bought? For I mean, first thing I ever bought that when I had money was... Uh, was a car I bought. I would just went to the lot and I, I picked out the most ex expensive expedition. I wanted an expedition so They're bad. Such good cars. And though. I just went and I said, I want the, what's the nicest one you got here? And he showed it to me. It was this black limited Eddie Bauer one. 
And I was like, great, I'll take it. He was like, well, don't you want to know how much it is? I was like, nope. I know I want it, and I know and I want it. And the guy was like, the guy laughed at me and literally asked me to leave. And he didn't, because I was in fucking a, a basketball jersey and shorts and flip-flops. Yeah. And I had to have my dad call and go, my son came in to buy an expedition. Uh, I need you to get it ready for him. He would like to buy it. And the guy laughed at my dad. And Ernie Hare Ford, the dealer, Ernie Hare from Ernie Hare Ford in Tampa, had to call the guy and chastise the guy. That's not how you sell cars in fucking Santa Monica. <laughs> and I wa and and Ernie Hare called me personally and said, "I apologize for the way that we're these our company has been handling this. Yeah. I've talked to him. You're getting it at a dealer discount." Go in and pick up your car. Well, and let, the guy apologized to me. So do, do you think the reason that... Well, first of all, I don't know. Did you come from money? Not, not really. I would say definitely came from privilege. Yeah. But I didn't, I, we didn't... We weren't like... I wasn't wealthy growing up, but we weren't rich. But you ha we had the things wealthy people had like we had cars and a house and sure had, we were members of a country club but that's if you're if you're in a country club you're that's rich it, people it wasn't shit, rich dude. though like we were always my dad was always living paycheck to paycheck how are you now though do you do you oh i'm really i'm really you good. And i have a business manager stuff? yeah that's i have a financial planner i have a, a money market manager i have leanne i have everything now what i am so glad is that maybe about a year ago because when i got the when i got the comedy central money and the jam really started bringing in revenue like like at first I was like, like I bought a Rolex, I got a Lexus, I did all this <laughs> shit. I know, Rolex. I know, but I already sold it because I realized <laughs> shortly after, Rolex. yeah, I, I got a sub. You I got should a, have heard my money, my problems one more time. <laughs> you bought a fucking Rolex? I got a sub, dude. And it kept its value. So when I sold it, I, like I got all my money back. But, oh, no, fuck. but, oh, but fuck. it's what I realized shortly after though, Bert. <laughs> I bought a Rolex. Oh, that's so fucking funny, Josh. That is so fucking fun. That's so me. That's so me. They were so alike when it comes to that. But then I realized, Bert, that I was like, I don't want to, to buy any more material things. I just want my time. Like that, so I don't have to take yeah. a job that I'll never want to do. Mm -hmm. Like, I just want to be able to enjoy my life. Literally, if I could just, if I can get a house and just have my dog and be able to go to the dog park do this podcast, do stand up, you know, do voiceover and act, but like never have to fucking, you know, like I, I need to book this or I'm fucking or take this or go on, like do a show that I don't want to do. Like yeah. that's what I've realized. And I'm so happy that I realized it before I really started making money, which is now starting to happen. And, but I'm the fucking same way as you. All right. That goes in to N word. I don't know what to say. That's what it's called. People. This is the kind of song that makes you realize how great Biggie is. This isn't a hit, just great storytelling. I love um, it. Play minute four, second oh five. Strike the match. Just what I expected. The dread kid ejected in seconds. And here come two opposite sexes. One black, one Malaysian. We in the hallway waiting patient. As soon as she hit the door, we start blasting. I saw her brains hit the floor. Wrong lasting, I swear to God. I hit Maxi Priest at least 12 times in the chest. Spit the round, shot the chick in the breast. She cried. What I love about that part is just that it's as like the story starts to progress, like the orchestration swells. Uh, but this is literally just Biggie flexing about how much of a great storyteller he is. Oh, now, God, yeah. when was the first time you went on stage and realized that you could do long form stories and that it would be able to introduce more of you to who to people to who you are? I told a story about taking acid and going to Disneyland with my two friends. And I remember as I was telling it, I was like, this is where I should be. And then right in that around then me and this guy, DC Benny started doing a storytelling night that morphed into him and Ben Bailey doing it. And it, and I went in there and I told the story about getting fired from uh, Barnes and Noble for peeing on in the basement or for uh, working out in the basement uh, in my underwear and getting in a fight with a black guy. Uh, and I told both of them back to back. And then, but they weren't like stage stories. And then I took that fight in a black guy story yeah. and told it on stage. And DC Benny came up to me and he was like, "Dude, that could be a bit." And I was like, "I think it's done. I think I got it." And he was like, "He was like, dude, you could just tell it just like that." 
That's it was very early on, and then I departed back from that and went back into writing like fun boy jokes of like of like you know what's fun to do, you know what's fun to do, you know what you got to do, your buddy, you know what I do sometimes. Here's what's fun to do. If you're ever with a girl and then she's like this, then you got to. I went back to that because I wasn't secure in who I was. Yeah, but that first that first story I told about taking ass and go to Disneyland, I was like, this is where I think I'm gonna belong. Like this is it. Well, your set has now become like it's just all stories, but it's literally you just explaining who you are, and it's 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 fucking super impressive to oh, watch thanks. as another comic. But uh, and that there's definitely stories for me that that I tell that it's like I've now become this big part of my set. But what I love about Biggie is just like the two best songs on this record, in my opinion, are that song and then the next one. I got a story to tell, which. Oh is basically Biggie flexing about a story. It's a scandalous true story. Basically, basically, Biggie is admitting that he was with a basketball player's wife, and when the player came home, they were going to get caught, so he decided to make it look like a robbery. But then it came out that this was actually about Anthony Mason. Uh, so Biggie had sex with Anthony Mason's girl. Have you ever cheated or been cheated on? And have you either have you gotten caught or vice versa? Yeah, I've cheated on every single person I've ever dated, except for my wife. And I've been cheated on probably by the exact same amount. <laughs> have you ever caught anybody or you gotten caught? I got caught one time so fucking bad. I was with this girl, Erica, upstairs. We, we, had, we had the attic. Me and my buddy, Obi, lived in the attic of this yes. house. Me and Erica were on the futon. We're hanging out. We're drinking wine. We're making out. And my girlfriend walks in. And my, I've been dating my girlfriend for like three years, four years. And she walks in. <sighs> gives me chill bumps right now to think about it. She goes, hi, can I talk to you for a second? And then introduced herself to Erica. I'm Alex. I'm Bert's girlfriend. Oh. And I went. Oh, <laughs> and it was oh, and then the worst part was that oh, Erica God, that stayed stays upstairs. With you, probably that look and that feeling. Oh, oh my God! Fuck! <laughs> Erica stayed upstairs in the attic, right? And there was only one stairwell down, and we were at the bottom of the stairwell. And Erica had to walk down past us to get home. She had to walk oh, past God. us and was like, "I'll see you guys later." And I was like, "Bye." Oh, that was fucking uncomfortable. Oh fuck, that was uncomfortable. <laughs> I got, I got, I got uncomfortable. That girl Alex deserved that. to cheat on me. <laughs> that's a that's a piece of shit move, dude. Oh, I, fuck. Uh, oh. All right, moving on because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, that goes into Notorious Thugs. I just remember my friends loved this song and then we played it nonstop when we were drinking and like first year out of college, out of high school. This was like the song that like. It just reminds me, and I wrote this, which is that this reminds me of hanging out in my buddy Greg's place with Mad Snaz. Mad Snaz was a guy that used to dress really shitty when I used to hang out with all the Outback Steakhouse people in 1997. Uh, I was going to say Biggie's versus Fire, but nobody steals it more uh, than uh, Busy's verse. Minute two, second 26. <laughs> I fucking love this song. I party with those guys. Did you really? Bone Thugs and Harmony. Why do you? Do you have a good story about it? Or? No, just we were at the the Cuban Club in Tampa, and yeah. we were all doing a corporate gig. It was one corporate gig. It was like a live concert. Tracy Morgan was on it. Or no, he was at the Improv, and he came down to party. Okay. And I was partying with Bone Thugs and Harmony. I was like the guy, and we were all hanging around. I want to say we were smoking and drinking, but I can't. Remember. I know I was. And they thought I was cool and they were with me. And then Tracy Morgan showed up and I was nobody. I, they wouldn't even, they didn't even remember who I was the second he showed up. Because Tracy just took he all He just took thunder. over the party. He took over the whole fucking party. Which and is I, so weird because you, that's how you are now. It's like when you show yo, up, it like the, all the attention goes to you. It was you, a predominantly black show and I, that I did stand up for. I'm almost positive I was in an airport and Busy was with his girlfriend in front of me. I knew it was really? one of the members of Bone Thugs. But I, but I like didn't want to say it because I wanted to be able to say it. I, I didn't know if it was lazy or crazy. Did he or... go up to the front and go, can I get a Nexatita? <laughs> can I get a Nexatita? Because <laughs> I'm group A, I want to get my thing today and skip it up a deed and beat him. I fucking love this song so much. Now, I really thought B Biggie's verse was the best out of that. But then once again, it goes into the storytelling aspect of it, of like reading into too much because you knew that... Uh, that Bone Thugs and Harmony was Easy E's group, right? Yeah. Uh, Easy E was already dead at the time. 
but you know Bone Thugs and Harmony was Easy E's group. You knew Easy E was West Coast. You knew that Dre hated Easy E. You there was all these like, dude. The it was almost like Desperate Housewives. Like you literally read into the drama and the gossip of everything. But this is basically a song uh, where Bone Thugs and Harmony have another story of Biggie's rise and drug dealing and some more glimpses into the East Coast, West Coast feud. And there's also another indirect mention about Tupac. Now, you have lived on both coasts. What are some negative things about both coasts to you? Uh, the m- negative thing about New York is it doesn't have pools. Like, you know, not everyone has a pool. Having a You're pool. You're a fucking pool dude, dude. I'm a real pool dude. You're a real. I saw that video. It was raining, like, and you literally still went in, did your thing. Well, that's your yeah. OCD. I love it. Oh, it's one of my favorite things to do is get up in the morning, especially if you're a little hungover, get in the pool, swim back and forth as many times as you can underwater, pop up, chill out in the water for another 10 minutes, get nice and cold, and then start your day. Dude, but the, pro- the thing is, especially going up in Florida, pools were something like if you got... Hot. If you had a busy day and you were hot and sweaty, at the end of the day, you could just jump in your pool and clean off. You didn't yeah. have to take a shower. In New York, everyone fucking smells. Like, you're always smelly. It's you're so, always it's stinky. It's such a stinky city. Dude, it's... It, to hook up with a fucking waitress in New York. Yeah. Because you get her, take her back to your place and her feet smell like shit. <laughs> but you hang out with any chick in L.A., and dude, they're like, hey, you want to jump in the pool real quick? <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah, dude. You want to get my hot tub? So what are your negative things about Los Angeles then? Uh, uh, separation of races. The, okay. se- the segregation in Los Angeles is fucking ridiculous. Like when you look, when I look at my neighborhood, we do not have very many black families that live in my neighborhood. But in New York, man, everyone is right on top of each other. There's no segregation. And you could say there is in different areas, but ultimately everyone's living in the same area. Yeah. And so, and there's no bubbles. You're not in your car. You're literally on a train with everyone with a fucking 13 year old black kid freestyling with a 80 year old uh, Puerto Rican woman with a rich uh, banker. Like everyone's together. I miss that. I, 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 Coming from Florida, which was fairly segregated as well, yeah, I love that. I loved being around people and feeling like a oneness of community. You know, the thing that John Rocker hated, I loved. See, that was how I grew up. Where I grew up, right outside of Washington D.C., it was like everybody in my high school was black, white, Asian, Indian. So it was just like I, there was no time to be racist because these are all of your friends yeah and i definitely see the separation of of like races here in los angeles um it it is like dude i love like i love when i go to like southeast or if i go to like like inglewood and it's just you start seeing all the gentrification start taking all these great areas and just whitening them up yeah so it is so not only is it is it even more separated where it's just like what happened with dc where it used to be chocolate city but because of the raise and like real estate they're just pushing like all the cultures out and, and just I, I could be ignorant and that could be happening in new york a lot i know Probably, it is in it's, brooklyn. i mean it, yeah i know it is in brooklyn dude. but but it you know i really felt like like new york was a true melting pot and i thought it was cool as fuck all right let's go into miss you this is one of your least favorite songs with yeah. 112 play 112's hook This is a song about loss and regret, often thought to be about Tupac, who was actually an old friend of Biggie's. And 112? Yeah, so this was... So Biggie, who is just about to get out of the drug game and potentially join the bad boy family when he shot... Oh, so this was a this was about one of Biggie's friends who was about to get out of the drug game, but he was killed right before he joined the bad boy family. Have you ever lost anybody or seen anybody in a shitty situation and had a real lasting that could have been me realization? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> we all took ecstasy in, uh, at a bachelor party in Atlanta. By the way, this is a hardcore secret because even my friends would know that uh, would I, this, was a, this is a time I lied and it was a hardcore secret. Yeah. We all went to a bachelor party at, I think, Magic City in Atlanta, which is an all-black strip club. Probably we, the most famous. And we got Ecstasy. We were in a tour bus. Yeah. We all got Ecstasy. Outcast album uh, had just come out uh, with Miss Jackson and Back of the Bus and all that had just come out. I guess that was probably Stankonia. 
and uh that was Stangonia, yeah. And um we all got ecstasy and we all went to take it. And I walked in, got into the tour bus late, and they handed me mine. And I went, yeah, and I just never got around to taking it. Never got around to taking it. It's in my hand. We're all talking. We're all talking. And then I go into the bathroom, and I go to take it, and I go, I don't think this is a good idea. It's in my head. I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think I need X C tonight. I haven't done X C in a long time. You know what? I took the pill, and I threw it in the toilet. I went, and I walked out. And they're like, hey, did you do that X C? I said, yeah, I just did it. And they're like, fuck, man, I think we got bad shit. And I was like, what? And people were collapsing and passing out. And Outkast back of the bus song was playing. And they were moving the bodies into the bunks in the back of the bus of guys that were passing out. And I was like, oh, my God. Thank Holy God I didn't shit, take that dude. ecstasy. And Did anybody every, die from it? No, no, no. There it was, was just it was just like probably like a sleeping pill type thing. No, I don't know what it was. I no, I don't know. I literally flew to New York the very next day because I was Fuck. I was living in New York at the time. But I remember hanging out with my buddy and my buddy had taken the ecstasy and he was like, "I'm feeling okay. Are you feeling okay?" And I was like, "I feel fine." But I never told anyone. I just never took it. I flushed it down the toilet. I paid for it and flushed it down the toilet. Jesus Christ, dude! I remember. Dude. I remember the. Everybody moved to the back of the bus, and they were moving bodies to the back of the bus. And I was Yo, like, "Turn that song up!" Ah, move, Cheryl. Get the fuck over there, Frank. Sit there. Another. It's a, the the next song that Biggie does with Little Kim. Uh, it's basically a song about being unfaithful. Uh, I will give it up for this. Little Kim crushes this song. Funny fact, during an interview with Wendy Williams, Faith revealed Biggie's infidelities and revealed the time she caught him and little little Kim in bed together. Also, Biggie ghost wrote pretty much this whole fucking rap for. So this is basically about being unfaithful. What steps have you done to ensure you continue to be in a long-lasting relationship that you're in now? I gained weight. <laughs> <laughs> You're so sexy, though, dude. You're so sexy with a little dude, chub. But... Honestly, you know what I do to make sure I stay faithful? What's I talk that? about how much I love my wife on stage. No chick's going to... Any chick that f would want to fuck me after a show is a piece of shit. Dude, I talk about my family so much on stage. People are like... People are like, dude... Like, there, there's no way I could be that guy. It would ruin my career. It would yeah. ruin my career if I cheated on my wife. Ruin it. And I love my wife a lot, so... I wish I had herpes. You can still get it. You got time, dude. It's <laughs> out there, man. It's waiting for you. All right. Uh, going back to Cali. What a fucking great song. You love the song? Oh, the phone. I love it. It's got part skit, part song. Yeah. Yo, Big, get up. I'm oh, up. yeah, the beginning with him and Puff. Dude, Big, it's... Big, get up. We got we to gotta get that money. Dude, this song, the reason I love this one the most is because like I'm a huge fan of Zap and Roger, and they take the sample from More Bounce to the Ounce, which is like one of my favorite songs of all time. I do like this song. I just don't think it fits in with the rest of the record. Do you know what I mean? It's just I do. I everything is this New York DJ premier, just more like even the pop songs, the pop songs still have this New York feel to them. And this one is just literally like a Dr. Dre song, which is. isn't bad. It is. it is. And it's not bad because the same thing with Biggie doing Notorious B.I.G. or Notorious Thugs, where Biggie could adapt the style of Bone Thugs and Harmony. Yeah. He, he does, you know, he turns into it to a West Coast MC when he does this. I wrote down this. I said, I love the way he says this line at minute three, second 55. For the business of Versace store, said she's talking till I ain't got no more. Only in L.A. Bust on bitches L.A. Rub it in their tummy. Lick it, say it's yummy. Then fuck your man. Fuck your man. <laughs> I love that. Uh, when did you decide that you were going to make the move to Los Angeles? The very second I stepped foot in California. The first time I ever, I was 26 years old, and I was, and I, the car picked me up. I, fl I flew first class back in the day on like United. So, wait, so what's going on in your life that you're getting? A Will first Smith class discovers ticket? me, flies me out. Uh, we meet, flies me out to LA to pitch TV shows. I fly out first class on like a Continental flight or a United flight, and it was the big, big, big. They, you know, first class back then was like you had like ten feet to yourself. Like it was just you had a whole area to yourself. Never flown first class. Land. They take me to Century City, the the Takamimi building from Die Hard. Oh yeah, dude. I walk out of that building. I I, I get all my 
porch and I, on my balcony in my room. My room's gorgeous. And I'm looking at the Fox lot, the bungalows on the Fox lot. And I'm like, ooh. I get out. I walk down to the mall in Century City. And my dad calls me on my Nokia little brick phone. Remember those oh, Nokia yeah, 7000s? Fuck yeah, dude. Calls me on it. And he says, how do you like California? And my first words to him is said, I'll be living here for the rest of my life. And he was like, what? I said, I'm going to live in California. I love this place. It was 70 degrees. It was fucking Perfect. All right, that takes us into 10 Crack Commandments. Uh, this is the hardest song on the record. This is DJ Premier just flexing as, as hard as he can flex. Coolest shit about this is DJ Premier wrote this song uh, for Angie Martinez's show on Hot 97 as a promo. And Puffy heard the promo and immediately called fucking Hot 97 and was like, I fucking want this song. Like, you know, and got, and then DJ Premier, they did the deal, and that's how this became a song. Also, Puffy really? Puffy did not want this song on the record. Biggie went behind his back to, uh, they recorded it, and and then this, like, showed it to Puffy, and Puffy would first, like, no, I don't think I want to get this beat. And then it came back, and then he's like, this is one of the hottest songs on the record. But it's literally about the commandments of being a crack dealer. Uh, all right, I have two parts of this question, and then one might go quick. Have you ever tried crack? No. You haven't? I've smoked cocaine, but I've never tried it's crack. It's pretty close, yeah, well, but it's, it's like, not crack. It's like you, you just lick the tip of your cigarette and dip it in. That's great, though. Yeah. Get a little oh. nummy, get a little... Put, put, <laughs> we used to call it, we guys used to have super joints where you sprinkle cocaine on a joint. Yeah. And... Oh, oh I know. Oh. Do your gums go numb? You're like fucking like, oh my God, that's a... Uh, yeah, turn this Grateful Dead off. I need something a little bit more. I don't even more. know if I need the marijuana in this. <laughs> All right, well, then there's, here's the follow-up question to that. What are the commandments that you live by? Uh, don't drink and drive. Don't cheat on your wife. Yeah. Tell the truth. Make sure it's funny. <laughs> yeah, man. Just all I care about. All my, my number one commandment is just giggle. Just find humor. Giggle. That's it. I just want giggle. I just giggling is my favorite favorite thing in the fucking world. We know world. that they say that if there's a person that like when you meet like a guru that's enlightened, they giggle like a child because that's that's how you you should be viewing life. Like 100%. it's all the other shit that we've loaded onto our consciousness that wears us down and makes us mad and makes us emotional, but like you know, if you can just take it all the way back to that childhood giggle, like that's it. That's the way that you live. That's such a dude, I fucking love that you said that, dude, cuz that is 100%, dude. So I giggle with my kids all the fucking time. All we do is giggle. Just fucking giggle. Dude, giggle. That's that's definitely the number one commandment. All right, play a hater. Uh, this song is pretty funny. Uh, not a bad song, but I just feel like it should have been left off the record. Contains a sample of Hey Love by the Delphonics and Basketball Jones by Cheech and Chong. Now, this is just a song, uh, literally what it says about being a player hater. Uh, have you ever held a grudge because of someone being in a better position than you? No, never. I've, I don't get caught up in that for some reason. I get, but you know why? I think because I'm a fan of shit. Like, yeah. I'm a fan of good stuff. And so, if someone's got good stuff, I get, I love it. Like, I, I'm, I'm sure I've been jealous of people that I would have deemed um, maybe not that talented blowing up. Yeah. But there's a thing that happens the older you get where you realize, oh, those those kind of weed out. Like people that aren't that talented that blow the fuck up and they're like, oh, this is the next big thing. But in your head, you're like, I personally don't see it. If you just allow it to just say, go like, I personally don't see it, but whatever, then it that always shakes out. It's like, I love comedy. I yeah. love what we do. If you can make me laugh, that's all I fucking care about. Sure. That's all no, I, I fucking that. care about. So do you, well, then why do you think that there's people that hate on you? You were talking like people yeah, that because, talk shit because about I, you. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I'm like, I'm, I'm very uh, honest about it, but like I perform my fucking shirt off. Like there's people who can go, who can, who can see that and go, oh yeah, okay, I get it. His fucking shirt's off. Like, and they maybe don't see that I write jokes and they go, well, I write jokes and yeah. I can see, I mean, I can, I'm a lot of a, I'm a lot, sadly, and I think I'm, a more talented comic than I'm given credit for sometimes, but like I'm a brand, you know, like I have like, like people look at me as like a, a brand, like a, like, like a shirtless drinking comic who robs trains. And it's like, okay, I get it. You know? So I think I, I can understand why people talk shit about me. I get it. So like if whenever anyone makes fun of me or what I do on stage, I, it rolls off my back. I go, I get it. I get it. All right. That goes into nasty boy. 
Uh, dude, you like this, this one? I fucking love this, dude. Play the chorus, Peter. That's literally it, and I fucking how about, love this. How about song. the stand up? The stand up? The stand up esque in this. She, I thought I'd done everything, girl. The girl wants me to shit on her. And the guy goes, oh, so, yeah, at the beginning, and, then, yeah. and then Biggie goes, so I'm shitting on this bitch. It's just a great, it's a great. It really I is. I have one of those in one of my jokes. It's it's such a, what I love the most about it is that he's got Too Short on it. And Too Short just has like this, this fucking, it's just literally both of them recounting their sexcapades. Uh, and Biggie kissed and told in the nastiest way possible whether it be a half indian lover he called tonto or freaks down for the one night stand biggie was getting it in on the female tip uh definitely one of my favorite songs in this but there are listeners out there that might not know you but equally that you seem very comfortable with your physique and usually perform shirtless yeah. when did you become comfortable enough to expose yourself uh, my entire life Really? I've you were the naked been, kid? Dude, I did not know I was fat until Tom Segura told me I was fat three years ago. Aww. When he, I swear <laughs> to God, I was like oblivious to the idea that I was overweight yeah. at all. I mean, I'm not even, not even like at all. I remember just, I never, I've never been self-conscious of my body ever in my entire life. I was like, oh, I look good. I look good. Like I've been that guy. And then when Segura started fat shaming me and everyone's like, you're a fat fuck. I was like, wait. Oh my God, I am fat. Like I started noticing things about my body that I'd never noticed. I was like, hey, wait, I've got like a bump in my belly button. Is that fat? <laughs> Shut the fuck up. I can't, my, it looks like I'm wearing a belt when I get naked. Fuck, is that fat? My dick looks like I outgrew it. Like what the fuck? I never, I've loved my body. I've been wearing Speedos my whole fucking life. I was the first guy at a fraternity party to get naked and run down. I never knew I had a small dick or I was fat. <laughs> so you were the naked guy like, like from, from name it. Dude, I always like I like I still do that. Like I'll like I'll do this shit with Avery. Avery is like he hates like male nudity whatsoever. You got a great dick though. Thank you, buddy. You, I, we saw it. We all saw it. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, what the fuck? So, what are you talking wait, about? I forgot we even brought this up. All right. So, for Bert did the goddamn comedy jam back for our, like, two-year anniversary. He wanted to do Give It Away by Red Hot Chili Peppers, and we all did Cock Socks. Yep. And I'll be honest with you, it was the most freeing, oh. liberating experience of my life Dude. to be standing up there and just, like, have just our dick covered. But at any second, if we turn quickly, the rubber band would come undone, and and you could just be fucking exposing yourself to 400 people. Dude, it was the one of the funnest times I've ever had on stage. Fat as fuck. Didn't even know it. God, dude. I love your body. My wife was in the audience with her friends. What'd they say? And they were like, you have a brave husband. And my wife goes, <laughs> oh, you think he's brave? <laughs> I'm married to him and you think that's brave. <laughs> she gets credit, man. That's fucking dope, dude. All right. Sky's the limit. Uh, Sky's the limit. limit. Keep playing the fucking chorus, Peter. What I love about this is that it starts with his mom talking about how much she loves him and then always believing in him and how he can he doesn't have to be afraid and he can be anything he wants. All right, the song is broken up into three sections. His early years in school being a good student but broke, then selling crack and going to jail, and then about Biggie reflecting on all the faults of his drug dealing life and how it which has persuaded him to become a rapper. Now, focusing, the part that I want to focus on the most is that you actually have Biggie's mom on this song. She says, baby, look at me. Mama, love you. Valletta and, Wallace. Yeah, Valletta Wallace. She's basically, like I said, she's saying to him, like, you have no reason to be afraid anymore. What are your biggest fears as a child, and have they faded? I, you know, I didn't have, I don't think I had any fears when I was a kid. I was fearless. I was, like, really, I just... It's so funny, man. I was when I was a kid. I wanted to be a rock climber. I wanted yeah. to be a kayaker. I wanted to be a sailor. I wanted to be a scuba diver. I wanted to free dive. I wanted to do all these. I wanted to skydive. All these things I did as an adult that I was terrified to do as an adult. I thought would be my literally not even my passions, but my hobbies. Like rock climbing. I was like, I'll definitely get into rock climbing. Rock climbing. I was so obsessed with rock climbing. 
Dude, I've been rock climbing. It's fucking terrifying. <laughs> I've been frozen at 100 feet on a rock where they're like, we need you to let go in order to get you down. And I'm like, everyone can fuck themselves. Oh, my God. Dude, rock climbing is terrifying. Scuba diving. I get fucking claustrophobic when I go scuba diving. Like, I can't. I go scuba diving. I get down to 90 feet. And I'm just like, fuck this. So then how did you, if you're so afraid of like the, how so much shit, then how did you get past all of that to do Bert the Conqueror? Same shit I just said about depression. You just put your shoes on. It starts with getting your, putting your shoes on. Just get, put your shoes on, and then then open the door, and then walk to the lobby. And in the lobby, they're going to tell you to get in the car. Get in the car. When you get to the place, listen to the instructions. Then put the scuba equipment on and just get in the water. <laughs> it's just it just move forward. Dude, completely. Uh, I mean, that's such good advice. But some of the shit that you've done, so I've done it all, and I've been absolutely terrified. And the only key is just move forward. Literally, just go. I, I got this. I can do this. I it, This sucks at the moment. I'm going to get through this. And then the one day I don't get through it, I just, that's the day I don't get through it. And I don't, and I guess I don't have to worry about it. What I love about that is what you just, uh, what you just answered is basically what the message in the next song is, which is the world is filled. Uh, and also to most millennial hip hop heads, the lines, when the Remy's in my system, ain't no telling, will I fuck him? Will I diss him? And that is also uh, Jay Z paid homage to Biggie by doing that same line in "I Just Want to Love You." Uh, this is a fucking this is a fucking great song. Now, at the risk of being too literal, because of Birth the Conqueror, this is about traveling, going to different destinations. We were just talking about Birth the Conqueror. Out of all that scary shit that you've done, what was the single most terrifying experience, and how did you psych yourself up for it? Number probably, and it, it's probably unwarranted, but the number one most terrifying experience I ever had was jumping off the stratosphere. Only because wait, the Vegas one? Yeah, I did that. I know, but I was the first person to do it. Oh my god! And it was, and I it was the first. I'd never jump bungee jumped. I'd never skydived. I had never done anything like that. And I started having panic attack panic attacks at one in the morning. I drank at dinner, had some tequila, some sushi, a few beers. Yeah. And then I was like, I'm good, I'm going to sleep. Woke up at one in the morning by falling off my bed. I fell off my bed and I was having a dream that I was falling off the stratosphere. Landed on the ground and was panicked. I was throwing up, I was dry heaving, I was sweating, I couldn't relax. I called my wife, I told my wife I had made a bunch of mistakes and that I was renting a car and going into the desert to disappear and that if the production called not to say anything that i would be in the desert and my wife's like honey you can't do this they're gonna sue us for the production cost she goes all you got to do is tell them you can't do it and so i told him that, that next morning i got up out of bed got dressed went down for breakfast yeah told the producer i can't do it he goes that's fine i was like what and he goes that's fine just don't do it at the edge at the edge just don't jump get to the edge and then don't jump but do it at the edge. You like to let me know at the edge. I'm not gonna like lead in that you're gonna sure, do it. Sure, yeah. Real brave. So we can do something through editing, or yeah. And we'll you're saying it. they would edit like a fa another person jumping? Nope, or? nope. They just get that would be the story. But you get to the fourth act. Bert's gonna jump. Bert's gonna jump, and he didn't jump. At the end of the fourth act, it would be me not jumping, and I yeah. was like, oh, I can do that. Like that'll be the story. Yeah. So then I get up there. I'm brave as shit. I'm doing cheers. I'm gonna jump off your build. Throw me off your building, kid. I got third graders chanting Bert, 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 Bert. I get up to the edge knowing full well I'm not going to jump. And I get over to the edge. I lean over and my camera guy goes, Scott Fans is, he's harnessed into the side of the building. He's hanging off the side of the building to get this shot. And he goes, hey man, if I were you, um, I'd just jump. I go, what do you mean? And he goes, it's fucking 16 seconds. It's 16 seconds and it'll be over. As opposed to the rest of your life, people are going to go, why didn't you jump? Why didn't you jump? All day tonight, why didn't you jump? As opposed to 16 seconds. And he goes, I can be honest with you, it's going to be a pretty cool shot of you jumping off this building, and that'll be in the promo for this show. I guarantee if you jump, you get picked up for a second season. <laughs> and he goes, and if you get picked up for a second season, this you can buy a house. And I, I, I literally, all I heard was, if I jump, I get a house. And I went, I'm jumping. Everyone's like, what? I go, I'm fucking jumping. And I go, oh, Scott, wow. I just all I'm talking to Scott. I go, you ready? And he goes, hold on. Give me a second. Give me a second. I'm ready. You ready? I go, I'm fucking jumping. I'm fucking jumping. I go, am I good? Am I good? And everyone's like, hold on. Are you really jumping? I go, I'm really fucking jumping. Am I good? They're like, you're 100% safe. I go, here we go. And I jumped. I jumped. I land. And it was the most cathartic release of energy I've ever had in my life. Like, 
literally all the panic flooded out of my body. I gave the most beautiful speech to the mayor, the mayor's wife, David, I think David Copperfield was there, like showgirls, hundreds of people are at the bottom of the stratosphere. I'm the first person <laughs> to jump off the fucking stratosphere. Doves fly out. I mean, it is, I take a <laughs> shot at tequila. Like, da, 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 Big bands, yeah. Da, 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 the ride da, is officially da, da, open. Da, da, da. That's, um, that's me. The ride is officially open. Ladies and gentlemen, Bertha Conger, this is better than the birth of my second child. This is better. It's beautiful. And the producer comes up to me and she goes, uh, We didn't get it. <laughs> she did not. Did they, they said they didn't get it. We didn't get it. And they really didn't. We didn't have audio on you. We didn't get Fuck. any of your speech. You, you should have told us you were going to jump. We'd have audio waiting for you down here, but you didn't jump. So all the audios, it, it didn't. You got to do it no again. No way. So I had to jump again. But you already knew it wasn't that bad, though, the no. second time. I had talked to a woman who had been testing the ride, this 60-year-old Viet Vietnamese woman who had been <laughs> jumping nonstop, right? She'd been jumping. They, for lunch, they got 50 bucks if they jumped. So she just would fucking eat her fucking, fucking sandwich. Like a protein and then, bar. And then, and then jump. jump as many times as she could in her lunch period yeah. and make as much money as she could and send it to her son who's in prison, right? Send okay. it for, yeah. So she goes, I just jump. I jump. I jump all day. I go, how bad? She goes, first time, not bad. I go, how about the second time? Second time, really bad. I said, why? She goes, now you know it doesn't work. And I was like, huh? She goes, if it doesn't work, now you know when it won't work. And I went, holy fuck. So the second time I jumped, all I could think is, now I know when it won't work. And as opposed to the first time when it just, it slowed me down and I was like, yay. The second time I'm jumping, I'm like, fuck, it's not stopping. 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 <laughs> Motherfucker. And then I was like, oh, it stopped. And then if you look my speech that oh I give, my God. all there is is fucking three janitors and that Vietnamese lady. Just that's the fucking <laughs> shot. Is three janitors. I was like, Every, all the band was gone. Yeah, was everyone just... came like 19 people had jumped since then. They were like, it's no big deal. We do it all the time. All right. Long kiss. Good night. Uh, basically, it's a RZA produced song. It's basically a Wu Tang song uh, with Biggie. Uh, this is the song that everybody says is the Tupac diss track. Really? Uh, yeah. So in the first verse, the lyric "Laugh now, cry later" is allegedly a reference to the two tattoos on Tupac's back. So basically, this is a song that people all assumed was about Tupac, but still Biggie and all the people in his tribe are saying that it isn't. Uh, in what ways are you misunderstood? <laughs> I think I think the whatever I've created for myself, my whatever like folklore I've created for myself or like whatever persona I people believe about me about like drinking and partying and fucking going hard in the paint. I think if you cut that in a quarter, that's who I really am. Like yeah. I'm, I, who I am on, is on stage is off stage is the same. I'm a big personality. I'm loud. I, I'm fucking do rip my shirt off. If if there's a stage I want to jump on it, I love to drink. But I think a lot of times people just assume I'm drunk 24 seven. That I'm literally just fucking drunk nonstop, and it's it's not the case. So like when I do stuff like when I go for a jog. People are like, oh, yeah, he jogs. He, those are like his joke videos that he does. I go, no, I really go for a jog every day. I go to spin class. I try to stay healthy. I have a cardiologist. Like, I'm a regular fucking person also yeah. who doesn't want to die. But I think people think I think people think my part, like, they think I can do a million shots. And I can do, I don't even, I haven't done a shot all year. But do you think that you're you're responsible for people thinking that 100%. because you put, you put on social media just... Dude, yeah, 100%. It's, it's, <laughs> and, and it's like I go on Rogan and I party and then they ask how much I drink and I'm honest. And I think I probably drink more than the average person. I think I probably party way more than the average person. But I think sometimes like my critics, like I remember Barry Katz was like, we did his podcast one time and he was like, are you ready to admit you're an alcoholic? And all I could think was, I, I haven't spoken to you in, in like 10 years. You haven't seen me in probably 10 years. Yeah. You haven't seen me. Like, you don't know anything. Like, we don't know me at all. Like, I'm... Like, who who are you to tell me I need to quit drinking? Like, what, what are you talking about? Like, what? Like, are you at my house with me on my children when I'm making homemade pizzas on our grill? Like, what do you think? Like, it was... It blew me away. And he was like, yeah, but that's what you show people. I go, okay, I get it. So then you got to take people's criticism of you with a grain of salt. 
because they think like sometimes it, it applies to fans. I remember a guy going, "Dude, you were fucking wasted on stage," and I was like, "I don't drink on stage. Like I don't I don't drink on stage. It's just what I just don't. I, mean, I have in the past. Yeah, and I could if I want to. But for a record, like across the board, you won't see me drunk on stage. It doesn't bother me. It's like I know who I am. My wife knows who I am. Like I'm cool with what where I'm at. Yeah. And by the way, it's not a. It's like out of all the things that could be thought about you. It's the one that you don't have to worry about. So like, oh, I, that's fine. As long as you guys are having a good time, I'm having a good time. All right. Uh, that, that's perfect. We got one more song, and I know you got to get out of here. This The last song of the record, you're nobody until somebody kills you. How, what a way to end a record when you're already dead. I know, dude. This is this this album, it's just, it's so great, yet it's like you said, man, This it's dark knowing that he died two weeks before this came out, knowing that they'll never find out who killed him. Like it's yeah. they'll never do it with the rampart trials yeah. and like they're saying that the police there were co- cops that worked for death row and it's just if the, it hasn't come out yet it probably never will unless Suge Knight admits to it yeah. which I'm hoping but basically uh, I love Biggie's first verse on this uh, Peter play Biggie's first verse niggas in my faction don't like acts and questions strictly gun testing coke measuring get the pleasure in the benzito Hitting fannies, spending chips at Manny's. Hope you creeps got receipts. My peeps get dirty like cleats. Run up in your crib, wrap you in your polo sheets. Six up in your wig, peace. Nigga deceased. Why? May you rest in peace. Uh, it's just, this is such a great song and a great way to end the record. Now, if you had to pick the way that you went out, how do you want to go out? Saving someone's life. Yes. That would be a way to yeah, go. Yeah, dude. That's a way to go. Do you have a, like, a situation? like? Uh, yeah, I've, I've thought about it a couple times. What would it be? Uh, plane crash. I start going in, going out, pulling bodies out, pulling bodies out. Cameras are now popping up, and I'm saying stuff like, <laughs> check out my Netflix special. <laughs> uh, they're streaming the machine also from 2006. Cast comes out on Tuesdays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Guys, I got, I got a second leg of the Body Shots World Tour starting up in September, just pulling out bodies. And then and then I hear from the back, there's one more in the way back. It's a person of color. And then I go, I love people of color. <laughs> they're transgendered. I love transgendered people. <laughs> He's handicapped. That's why he's in the back. I'll get him. Don't worry. worry, worry. <laughs> and everyone's like, poor Christ, he was the greatest man in the world. He gave his white privileged life up to save a person. And then I rescued oh. that person. And the person's like, yeah, but my wheelchair is in there. Can you go get that? <laughs> I'll be right back. He, I'm getting his wheelchair on 20s. And then like literally, Zims. literally as you like, you get to the door, you're like on fire and you're oh. pushing the wheelchair chair out and it falls <laughs> dude i love you man thank you so much for coming on dude, I love uh, you too, this man. was so much fun uh thank you brother. i love you brother thank you Rich bitch shit, drinking crystal till they piss the shit. Uh, thorough bitches, adapt to any borough bitches. Be in spots where there were no bitches. I mean, how can you not love that man? Bert Kreischer, ladies and gentlemen, for all things Bert, go to his website, Bert, 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 dot com. Three Berts dot com. On all social media, you can find him at Bert Kreischer. Watch his new Netflix special, Secret Time. Listen to his podcast, BertCast, and also the Body Shots World Tour is going to be in Europe and Australia, and it'll be starting up again this fall. Pre-sale for all fall dates happen on April 22nd. I'm also going to be posting his mixtape track listing link at the 500 website. It's where you can find everybody's mixtapes, guys. Every guest on the show makes a mixtape for all of y'all. So you can get inside the musical minds of Bill Burr. You can get inside the musical mind of Jim Jeffries, Kevin Nealon, Peter Billingsley, whoever, however, it's all there for you guys. And for all things 500, go to the500podcast.com. Like I said at the beginning, email the podcast at 500podcast at gmail.com. Follow me on social media at Josh Adam Myers. 
and a couple dates that I got coming up, guys. May 13th, the goddamn Comedy Jam is going to be at the Roxy with Bill Burr, Jackie Tone, Joe Sib, and more. Get those tickets at my website, joshadammyers.com. Also, uh, next week, I'll be at Moon Tower Comedy Festival, one of the, my favorite festivals in the land. We are doing a live 500 taping. We are doing a goddamn comedy jam, and I'm doing a shitload of stand-up, guys. Go to austintheater.org backslash moontower dash comedy for tickets and passes to anything at the Moon Tower Comedy Festival, guys. It is one of the best festivals out there. Come and join us and have a great time. Don't forget to subscribe to The 500 on your favorite platform and uh, go ahead and leave a review. Review it, guys. Tell us how much you like it. Rate it. Do everything. Also, guys, we have a club. The 500 Club. We're giving you the podcast a day early on Record Store Tuesday. We're giving you a full uncut episode because we're taping a lot of great stuff, but we're trimming it down for everybody else. You get the full episode. We're giving you a free podcast that's not released to anybody but the Patreon people. And if you've been a member for about six months, we're sending you free shit as well. So join the 500 Club, guys. You can find it at the500podcast.com backslash club for all details on our Patreon membership options to support the 500. Now, we just listened to Notorious B.I.G. from 1997. Now, here's an artist that was directly influenced by this album. From Benny the Butcher, we have his new song, 97 Hove. If you're in a band and were directly influenced by one of these albums or artists and you want your music featured at the end of the 500, send your song to 500 podcast at gmail.com and make sure you put the album and the artist that influenced you in the subject line. Next week is Elvis Costello week with his 1979 album Armed Forces. So y'all got some homework to do. Thank you so much, Fleece Army. The King of Fleece signing off. Stay fleecy. Black tape for the strap, Bitly in the parking lot, ashtray full of pack. Had dreams of retiring and burying the money. Back when I was young, with more experience than money. Look, all my Georgetown shit rocked the blue Hoya. When they snatch my niggas up, I got a new lawyer. They start off young, so they shoot for you. I groom them soon, they become their own bosses and recruit for you. It's not a such thing as too loyal. This gap melts your favorite rapper, protect them to a pool for you. You think you're nice, well I got news for you. I get them true for you. It's funny when every rapper fool to you. My bitch asking me to settle down. I was reckless at selling brown. She know I'm finally on level ground. I'm trying to change, but in my head it sounds. Telling me I could be El Chapo instead of Kevin Lyles. Freestyle for clue, I feel like 97 hole. It was 96, she pulled up in that 97 roll. Uh, drove it back and forth and went through 97 tolls. Real stories about drug money got me etched to stone. Uh, by the time they learn to love me, I be dead and gone. Real hustlers treat the rentals like they second home. First double up, $30, seven stones. See, I fucked it up, but that whole place set the tone. Real angry. You know why I'm made? Let me tell you why I'm made. I'm made because everybody on these records lying. Everybody lying. Everybody just beat these boys. Everybody be hardcore gangsters. Everybody gonna do this to each other when they see each other. And the truth be told, we too blessed and we having too much money in this rap game to be going to war with each other. Right. Okay. And the truth be told.